Thank you so much, James. It's good to see you, Jeff. Thanks for having me out. Thanks for putting this together last minute, like I said. Just passing through, doing a bunch of talks right now at this time of year, uh, which is great. I've missed it the last couple of years, doing lots of lectures because uh, I'm a queen raiser. I raise several thousand queen bees in a year. It's really busy from Florida starting in January all the way up to about August or so, and then Queen work just stops, and I like to do a bunch of talks and talk about the experiments I've done, what I've learned in the year. So it's really nice to get back to that and uh, meet up with beekeepers around the country again. But uh, so, how are the bees doing? How's morale? <laughs> Winter's coming, everyone's hunkering down and stuff. So uh, I had a really good season. You know, it was a little a drought in some areas, but drought was better than the, the flooding and rains we had last year. And my bees in Florida just dodged a hurricane, so I'm on the East Coast and. There was some flooding there, but it could have been a lot worse, like on the West Coast. So I'm grateful for that. It's just a matter of time, I'm sure. But anyway, tonight I'm gonna stick to what I'm good at. And that's uh, talking about myself. So <laughs> uh, I run a, a small queen rearing operation called Anarchy Apiaries. I've been a commercial beekeeper for 19 years at this point. <coughs> These days, I call I consider myself a recovering commercial beekeeper. Because I started in the industry doing almond pollination, uh, you know, moving hives with forklifts and, and stuff, learning the ropes that way. But these days, I pretty much just wear shorts and sandals, play with my bees, never put a veil on, and just stay at home. So, so I'm very different so than uh, with most of the commercial industry. And even if I raise 5,000 queens uh, a year, like I have in the last couple of years, it's a, that still makes me a pretty small-time queen producer. But that pays the bills, and mostly I just consider my apiary like a big art project, you know, it's one big experiment and I just try to keep it fun all the time. So speaking of fun, <laughs> speaking of an art project, this image, like what is this? It's like, it doesn't even look like this is a bee talk. I don't even know what this is doing here. But uh, so this image is actually uh, what made me want to become a farmer and that led me to become a beekeeper. When I discovered this about 20 years ago, in one of the permaculture books, by Bill Mollison. Uh, in Australia, this idea of permaculture uh, got started, permanent agriculture, this idea of working with ecosystems rather than trying to control them, you know, working with the cycles of nature and uh, uh, rather than trying to sterilize and put everything into row crops. Uh, but this idea of like sustainable ag was pretty novel in the 80s and 90s. So um, I was looking through one of these permaculture books, and page by page, he had all these funny drawings, and I came on this drawing and so what people were doing in the bush of Australia was building these PVC pipe structures and putting these structures out in fields and field mice were going in and they were storing wild rice and wild grains in these pipe structures. And humans were going in and harvesting the grains from these field mice. And they said as long as they left about 20% of these grains in the structure, the mice just kept packing more and more in. And this just blew my mind. This kind of shattered the screen I was using to look at the world. Like, whoa, suddenly our pests are our allies. It was such a, a, a different perspective. And I realized that, well, this different perspective can be applied to everything, like, like where our food comes from. All, I just saw so much potential for change in agriculture. It made me want to be a farmer. And I met friends who knew uh, beekeepers in Vermont, commercial beekeepers, who said I could park my van out back of the honey house and just go to work for a living and just get stung, which is what I did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these, this idea of having a different perspective of looking at how we can work with, with natural cycles uh, stuck with me and uh, my whole time as a beekeeper. And why do we need different perspectives? Well, things are changing, you know, in, in this bee world. They're changing pretty rapidly. And so this was a mudslide in California a couple of years ago. California is often in drought, but when it does rain, problems also happen. So they couldn't even get the forklift off of the back of this truck to unload the beehives like this. So weather patterns are changing rapidly and beekeepers, even when your hives are happy and healthy, uh, we face these problems these days that keep us all on our toes. There's really no normal anymore. You used to be able to predict when, you know, when to, put the extra boxes on your bees, when the honey comes in, uh, how cold it's gonna get in winter, when spring will happen, but now every year is so different because it's all global weirding or whatever you wanna call it. But this was in Texas uh, and normally a dry spot. You know, there's 400 hives here. It's one of these 100 year floods that are happening more often than 100 years. So beekeepers are all on their toes and we have so many problems and pests that we deal with 
There's one on the left that the beekeepers here are probably familiar with. That's the Varroa destructor mite. This one on the right is a mite that right now is in Southeast Asia. It's the Tropolelops mite. Now this mite is hosted by the giant honeybee, Apis dorsata, and we figure it's just a matter of time before this mite jumps on to our honeybees, Apis mellifera. The same way that the Varroa mite that we all know and love <laughs> has jumped from Apis serrana, you know, an Asian honeybee, onto our Apis mellifera. We, uh, we know this mite can jump onto our bees, and it's just going to spread around the world the same way that Varroa has. So there's more pests and problems coming down the line. What is a beekeeper to do? Well, the way I see it, it's not colony collapse disorder that we're dealing with. I think the bees are going to be just fine. For me, it's more, it's not like CCD, it's more like PCD, people collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. Honeybees, we have, have been around for, we figure, 60 million years. I really think that they have the ability to solve problems. You know, they wouldn't have survived for so long if they didn't have this ability to heal themselves and figure out uh, what to do in order to live. Whereas people, we're doing the complete opposite of what bees do. Honeybees have been the catalyst of diversity around the world. Just the way that they eat. They spread pollen from flower to flower, and that enables the seed that's produced from that to have two different sources of genetics and it creates diversity that way. So the reason we have so many different flowering plants, so many different fruits and vegetables and things that we humans eat are because of bees have done this work for millions of years enabling biodiversity. Humans are going into landscapes and we're doing the exact opposite. We're just uh, sterilizing everything, spraying it down, and just putting in row farms of just one crop. And those crops have lots of problems with pests, and uh, so they need lots of pesticides and chemical use. Uh, or we're just making them into parking lots. It almost looks suicidal. It turns out the United States is actually a net food importer. We're not even feeding ourselves in this country anymore. But what uh, we are, uh, what we, the food that we are growing in this country is being enabled by beekeepers. You know, beekeepers of all kinds work very hard to enable pollination. Yeah, we make some honey, we make some beeswax and make candles and stuff, but the bees that we steward uh, are, are enabling the food that is still produced in America. And these guys work really, really hard to try to keep their bees alive, going from these monocrop farms. And those farms are poisoning them from all the pesticide use and they're uh, stymieing their nutrition because it's just one kind of thing growing. Uh, and bees need a diverse nutrition, different flowers, different protein sources in order to eat. So the bees are being carted from farm to farm that's poisoning and malnourishing them. You add the stress of being on the road, it's really no secret why bees are dying. So I didn't know anything about bees when I got into this mess. <laughs> and uh, I signed up for a thousand hive operation in Vermont. Uh, and it seems like a, even my first day, not knowing about bees, that you know the bees uh, didn't seem to like me <laughs> at first. And I got stung even before I got a bail on, walking into my first bee yard. I didn't even open up a hive yet. I just strolled in there. Maybe I didn't move right, or I didn't smell right, <laughs> or something. But I got stung, I think, six or seven times in the neck. They got stuck in my hair, started stinging, and I freaked out. I'd never been around bees before. I ran. I ran a couple hundred yards away, and the bees stopped chasing me after a while, and I sat down, I caught my breath, I started picking the stingers out of my neck, and I looked at this beautiful green field and this beautiful blue sky on this Vermont spring day, and I waited to see if I was going to die. And I didn't die, and somehow I finished out that first day of work. For some reason, I came back the next day, and at that point, I was totally hooked on beekeeping. I realized it was the hardest thing I had ever done. And for that reason, I wanted to stick with it. And that was 19 years ago. I've been beekeeping just about every single day since. You know, spending winters in either Florida or California or Hawaii, just learning as much as I can about bee biology. And I don't mean to start with this story of getting stung to intimidate you folks who don't have bees yet or want to get bees or your new beekeepers here. These days, getting stung is my favorite part of beekeeping. We say if you don't get stung, the honey doesn't taste as sweet. You know, it's part of the work. 
but really beyond just the, the, the benefits we know of getting stung. Uh, getting stung is good for your immune system. It increases your white blood cell count. It increases your cortisone levels in your joints. It prevents and reverses arthritis, multiple sclerosis. It's just like, it seems to keep you healthy, having a little bit of poison in your blood. But beyond these like documented physical benefits we get from getting stung, my favorite part of it is the psychological benefits. The fact that I can get stung anytime I go out to the bee yard, it keeps me awake, it keeps me aware, it keeps me present, and I have to be in that moment every time I open a beehive. If I'm thinking about my day, if I'm thinking about what I gotta do tomorrow, when I open a beehive, the bees are gonna sting me. And all my life, people have been telling me to speed up, you know, be more productive, do more, 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 whereas the bees were telling me to slow down. Pay attention and focus on that moment and just be present. So I think the psychological uh, uh, benefits of, of just the fact that I could get stung, it's one of the best gifts that honeybees give us. And uh, beekeeping as a practice becomes just a meditation, the way that you have to move around and be all zen. Once you get the handle of that and how to move and deliberate fluid motions, stings are pretty rare. So, well, I started in you know, a thousand hive operation in Vermont. I moved out west, and it seemed like all my friends were moving to Brooklyn in New York City. I decided on a whim to move to Montana, and I got a job with a beekeeper out of the phone book my first day there, and I signed up for a 5,000 hive operation. We had four hives on a pallet, we put 480 hives onto a semi truck, and we shipped several semi loads of bees down to central California, and we rented those hives out to almond growers. Those almond trees were 100% dependent on honeybee pollination. And so met a great deal, probably most of the commercial honeybees in this country go to California in the winter for when the almonds bloom in February. After that bloom was done, we scooped up the bees out of California. We shipped them up to Washington State to pollinate apples for a couple weeks. Then we brought them back to Montana to pollinate cherry trees. We did uh, some vine crops and melons through the summer. The bees made a little bit of honey, but mostly we were just revamping them to do this pollination circuit year after year. And it was fascinating. But these beekeepers never missed a time to treat or a time to feed, because if they did, the next time they went to their bee yard, they might not have any bees left. Their bees were not adapted to uh, survive without you know, the supp supplements provided by the beekeepers. And like I said, the honeybees have all this stress from this migratory pollination. Uh, just from those losses, the beekeepers wanted hives that were growing all the time. Uh, it's basically like a, an Italian yellow uh, colored bee that uh, is turning all its food into brood. So you have to keep feeding them if there's not honey coming in. And since they're brooding all the time, they're also growing parasites all the time. So they need constant medications to keep those parasitic mites down. And these beekeepers are the first ones to admit that what they do is not sustainable, that they've created a monster. But things used to be a lot easier for them. They used to be able to stay at home and just sell some honey to make a living and support a family. And there's no beekeepers at any scale who can just make a living selling honey. So much of it, over 80% of the honey consumed in this country is coming in from overseas at pennies a pound. Us, our commercial beekeepers, we can't uh, compete with that. So we do migratory, migratory pollination. Some beekeepers sell bees and stuff. We make a little bit of honey that maybe might pay for your fuel bill for the year, but you can't really come ahead just selling honey on any kind of scale. It's rough. But this migratory pollination is fascinating, and it's how I learned the ropes. And I did it for a couple years when I got a call from my first boss in Vermont. He told me that his bees were crashing. He was down to 500 hives from the normal thousand that he ran. And he was tied up on the marketing end of selling honey and, and, and value-added products. Uh, so he didn't know what to do. And what he decided was uh, to hire some people to pick his hives up by hand. He didn't have a forklift even. And he shipped them down from Vermont down to South Carolina to hopefully give them a milder winter, an earlier spring buildup, so he could save his bees and save his beekeeping business. He didn't have anyone who could go down and work those hives, so he called me up desperately and asked if I could go. Uh, the, this was the spring of 2005, and me being totally a naive, I said, sure, there's no guarantees in the bee world, but I'll see what I can do. And he stressed the fact that I was going to be all alone. So he, he sent me a map and, uh, and told me where to go, and it was March of 2005 when I uh, arrived in eastern South Carolina, and I 
started going through the hives that he had brought down there, and I had to call him right away to tell him another half of the bees had died. He barely had 200 hives alive from a normal thousand that he ran, and the ground was literally crawling with shriveled wing bees. They had a disease called the formed wing virus. They, they were sick. The brood looked terrible. Uh, the bees weren't even like, making it to, to adulthood. Uh, and he had a white strip in every single hive. That white strip was called checkmite. And uh, checkmite is an organophosphate. It's a kumaphos. Uh, it's a neurotoxin. It's really nasty stuff that was meant to kill these parasitic mites. I pulled up one of these checkmite strips, and there were varroa mites crawling up and down on the strip that was meant to kill them. The checkmite had lost its efficacy. It, uh, I literally just witnessed the failure of this treatment. Checkmite um, had replaced apistan. Apistan was the first chemical treatment in this country. It worked for a couple years, stopped working so well, got replaced with checkmite. Checkmite worked for a couple years, and I just really realized that this was a dead end road. You know? I was 24 years old at the time. I was responsible for millions of little lives, and I really had no idea what I was doing. So I explained all this to the boss and said, like, we could lose this entire operation. The bees are dying every day here. It looks terrible. And I didn't know what would happen. But then the next day, 12 liters of formic acid showed up on my doorstep. These days, formic is a, a legal product to put onto your bees to try to kill the varroa mites. Uh, you can get it in a gel pad or, or things like that. Um, Mite away or Formic Pro, things like that. But this is before all that safer handling came about. This was raw Formic acid that I had to figure out how to mix down to the right solution. And I got some butcher pads and just dipped them in this acid solution. And I held my breath as I lay them on the tops of these beehives in a desperate act to try to save them. Um, uh, people like to talk about beekeeping or any kind of uh, animal husbandry as um, uh, integrative pest management. You know, your first lines of defenses are um, uh, genetics, and then mechanical controls and manipulations you can do, and uh, what your last resort would be in order to lose your entire crop or your entire herd or something. So this last resort was formic acid in, these case, in this case to save these bees, which they had already uh, like tipped balance and were going down. So it was a desperate act like that. But I um, put some sticky paper on the bottoms of some of these hives and I came back the next day after putting on this acid and there were literally rows of varroa mites that had fallen from in between the combs. The mite drop was in the thousands. This stuff killed varroa mites and I was psyched about it. I thought that I was saving the bees, quote unquote. <coughs> But going through those hives, I realized that that acid treatment had burned a bunch of the eggs and larvae, and it killed a bunch of the young bees that were now dead in front of the hives, and it killed a bunch of the queen bees, that, and it made the hives queenless at that. So formic acid these days, even though it's a safer gel product pad, at the right dosage and at the right temperature, this is what it will do to your beehives. It'll kill mites, but it's also very, very tough, even though it's considered an organic treatment. It's very hard on the bees. And like I said, in this case, it was a desperate uh, last resort. So, but the, the bees weren't dying now from a mite infestation anymore. And I didn't have any queens ordered. The boss said, uh, go, it's, it's very, very hard to find queen bees uh, that are mated and ready to go for someone to ship you at the last minute in the springtime. So the boss said I could just make splits with eggs or make what's called a walk away split. You have a strong hive, take one of the boxes and, and move it to a new location. Just take a strong hive and split it in half. And so you make one hive into two and whatever side is queenless, the bees will build a queen in her absence. They'll pick a, a couple of larvae and feed them extra royal jelly, make some queen cells. And then only one queen will win a battle with her sisters. They go on a mating flight, come back and start laying eggs like that as if they had swarmed. So, we didn't have any hives that were strong enough to do that to. They weren't at this splitting or swarming level. These uh, bees had been knocked back by the varroa mites, and then they got knocked back by the varroa mite treatment that they weren't ready to split like that. And I wanted to speed up the process and just do the best job that I could. So I did some reading. I hooked up with some local beekeepers there in South Carolina, and I taught myself how to graft. Grafting is the process of picking up a tiny larva uh, from a breeder colony, the, the one whose genetics you want to propagate, 
and taking that tiny larva and putting it into a queen cup, like so. So a little tiny cup like this, I can place a larva in each one of these cups, and then I'll put this grafting frame, we call it, with all these grafted larvae, into a very strong hive that doesn't have a queen. So, like I said, that walk away split, I can take a strong hive, just cut it into two, and whatever side is queenless will build one new queen, hopefully. Or I can go into that same strong hive, I can remove the queen, I can remove all the eggs and remove all the larvae so they have no ability to build their own queen. I'll leave them in that queenless state for a couple hours, and this stresses them out. This is totally invasive, manipulative beekeeping here, but it's all means to an end because in that queenless hive, which we call a cell raiser, I can put in one of these grafting frames uh, with 40 or 50 or more of these queen cups, and I can make 50 new queens in that same amount of resources. So anyone who's bought a hive or bought a queen, chances are that she was grafted doing this process of picking up a larva, putting it into a queen cup, and putting it into an artificially queenless cell raiser. So these days I like to use the, uh, the push button grafting tool, it costs like $2.99 at any bee supply place, but I didn't have one of those grafting tools, and this was long before Amazon was a thing, <laughs> or so many bee supply places, because uh, beekeeping wasn't a popular thing back in 2005, like it is these days. But I had a paper clip, and I hammered down the end of this paper clip into a little tiny spoon, and I tried to use that to lift up these larvae and place them into these queen cups. And I was just doing everything wrong. Uh, I was rolling the larvae out of the cells, that was just matching them up. Uh, I was using sunlight to see what I was doing, and the, the UV was just frying those larvae before I even grafted them, and it really didn't work for the, the first several times I tried this grafting, until the honey flow started, and it was from the Tupelo trees, that famous Tupelo honey uh, in South Carolina swamps. The honey just started pouring in, and the bees just got so mellow and happy that they started accepting their larvae I was grafting. Ten days after the graft, I would uh, go into the cell raiser, I had a bunch of queen cells ready to go, and I put each one of those queen cells into a small queenless split, and then the queen would then go on a mating flight about a week later, come back, started laying eggs, and I was amazed to see this actually work. Uh, so for me, really not knowing what I was doing, trying to, to learn this grafting, the honey flow helped so much. And then my splits started to really grow, and I started having to split the splits. And I ran out of frames, and I ran out of boxes. I started having to build frames and boxes and wire in foundation all night long just to use it all up the next day and make more splits and do more grafting. And I did it day after day. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. All I did was work bees by day and build equipment at night. It was full immersion, deep cover beekeeping. And, you know, the, until the phone rang, it was the boss up in Vermont, he asked me how it was going, and I looked at the calendar, I realized it was the start of May, and I counted the splits that I had made and all the bee yards I had started, and I realized the operation was back up to a thousand hives. And so grafting is not something that your beekeepers have to learn, but in this case, it really helped get a lot of queens and a lot of bees really quickly. So if you want to uh, rapidly recover, in this case from Varroa mites, I realized that grafting would enable this uh, process to happen. No matter what kind of beekeeper you are, if you want to have lots more bees, grafting was all about the numbers. So we brought these bees back up to upstate New York, uh, put them on the dandelion honey flow, and 2005 was just a bumper year. Some of those early queens that I had raised went on to, make, to lead hives that made over 300 pounds of honey in just one hive, with, like, with my queen in it. So it made me a believer. I was like totally hooked and realized that I want to breed queens. You know, not just for mite resistance, but also for honey production and winter survival and just hardiness and, and, and better bees with less inputs. So the boss said that I'd done such a good job and I was making way less than minimum wage to <laughs> it with all the hours I was putting in anyway. He said, take 10 hives for, for doing this rescue operation. <laughs> So I picked 10 hives from the operation that I was already using as breeding stock, uh, hives that didn't have the, the shriveled wing, the deformed wing virus. They didn't have the spotty brood. They were healthy but, and, and were able to cope with this mite infestation. And they became the base of the genetics that I'm still working with today. They were my, the first bees that I ever acquired uh, of my own.
that spring of 2005 was the last time uh, my bees were treated. So I say I treat them nice, and while all my friends uh, told me all my bees would be dead within two years from parasitic mites, uh, that was 17 years ago, and I still have plenty of bees, more than I know what to do with, but it's all because I know how to raise queens. It's I know how to rapidly recover if I were to have major mite losses again, and things like that, but grafting is not something that uh, is necessary, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, various queen rearing methods. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to fill my time <laughs> until they kick us out of this library, but these were some of the early, early uh, queens that I raised when I was 24 in the swamps of South Carolina. So. I went back, um, after I got my first bees, I went to them in Vermont, but I uh, realized I needed to make some money if I wanted to start my own breeding program, get more bees and things. So I went back out west for another year, did migratory pollination, uh, uh, saved all my money just to buy me some time to figure out what I was doing. Uh, I wound up in Florida working for a beekeeper with 15,000 hives. Well, first I had done blueberries in Maine, then cranberries in Massachusetts, and now I was doing citrus in Florida and uh, working Raising Queens commercially for some folks. But I had uh, I brought my own five hives down to Florida. And now we're, oh, where, where are we? 2008 now, that spring of 2008, I turned my five hives into about 180 nukes. A nuke is a, a little nucleus hive, a little baby hive. So I was able to take five hives and turn them into 180. And again, this took about two months and uh, because I was grafting. At this point, I was calling them survivor stock because I, I, had, I had stopped treating and was just raising them from the best survivors with the most vigor. And I had broken the brood cycle, which I'll go into, and that also knocks down the parasitic mites because the mites are also propagating in the bee brood. So these bees were super healthy and they were these good genetics that I, I, I believed in. And I brought my 180 little baby beehives back up to New York where a lot of my friends were starting farms, starting community supported agriculture. And I was super proud of these bees and they were uh, healthy and started to bubble out the size of the boxes. But then they started running out of room and they started swarming and I looked around and I didn't have another frame or another box or anything to put these growing bees into. And I burned through all my pollination money at that point. I was broke again. So it was really at that time that I, I stumbled on the real mission of Anarchy Apiaries. It's to bring the means of production back to the beekeeper, to make beekeeping a lot more simple, uh, a lot simpler, a, a lot more affordable, a lot more feasible than it's been for the past 160, 170 years. So I'll do a little history lesson of like where our beekeeping has gone in the last two centuries. You know, before 1851, before Lorenzo Langstroth patented the movable frame hive, everyone had bees, but there really wasn't a bee industry. There wasn't a commercial beekeeping world. Yeah, people sold some honey here and there, but basically everyone had a little bit of honey because everyone kept bees on every like church or farm or school. There were beehives around. Uh, and so everyone could get a little honey here and there, but the bees were basically wild. They were in straw baskets, such like this or so, or they were in um, uh, hollowed out logs, or just if you had four boards, you could hammer them together. They just, these just needed a hollow space, but they were basically wild. They'd swarm out to the woods, sometimes they'd come back, they weren't manipulated, or there was not, no artificial splitting uh, like uh, there is today. And this was sustainable beekeeping for thousands of years. So it's basically like you're just keeping a hollow tree of bees in your backyard, getting some honey from time to time. Um, but, uh, you know, when the Industrial Revolution came around, everything was kind of getting streamlined and uh, improved upon. Uh, Lorenzo Langstroth patented bee space, this idea of the movable frame hive, what the commercial bee boxes we know of today are known as Langstroth hives since 1851. And it was uh, a brilliant discovery of bee space, uh, the right spacing to build a frame around the cone. And what it really enabled was spinning these frames of honey cones in a centrifuge. So you put your honey frames in a centrifuge, you spin out the honey, and you can save the wax year after year. So in a hive like this, you would have to cut out the honey combs, you mash them up and uh, destroy the honey cones, and you strain the honey and separate the wax, and the bees have to rebuild every year. So they have to make new wax in order before they can make a honey crop. But if you can give them the wax back, which these movable frames allowed, now all the resources could be just could just go towards surplus honey, and it worked great. 
pretty much overnight the bee industry was born because now these beekeepers made huge yields of extra honey. And people started keeping bees for a living full time. And it worked great for a couple of decades until some contagious diseases started spreading. From first from hive to hive and then from bee yard to bee yard. The main disease is American fowl brood, AFB. It's a highly contagious spore forming bacteria which can't be killed. It can be irradiated or burnt, and it's still the most uh, uh, heinous bee disease <laughs> in, the, in the bee world today, because uh, it's uh, as bacteria has a spore that, uh, that really can just infect equipment. If a hive dies from it, other bees will rob out that hive and bring it back home with them. And so American fowl brood started wiping out these apiaries. And so what this uh, the budding bee industry decided to do was ban hives that couldn't be inspected. So a straw basket or a hollow log is actually an illegal hive in, in most states, even to this day. What the public still thinks of the image of a beehive is it's not allowed because you can't inspect this for this disease, American fowl brood. And this is a good thing because I know people who have gone out of business uh, from American fowl brood. They couldn't keep it under control. And that's why we have registration programs in most states and why we have bee inspectors. And so if there's any ever a problem, if your brood smells weird or looks weird, uh, a lot of states have a resource you can call. Either your ag extension or your state bee inspector can come out and make sure it isn't this terrible disease. Because if your hive dies, if you throw that equipment on another hive, you could like kill that one and kill all the bees in the neighborhood or wherever they can fly. So uh, it's, it's a good thing to have inspections and check out your hive because of this like, highly contagious disease. So um, it was good that the, the registration happened, but once these hives were made illegal, everyone had to conform to a legal hive type. They were presented with the Langstroth hive, and everyone either converted or they were outlaw beekeepers. A couple generations went by, and all these other methods of beekeeping, all these old methods were lost, like that. Everyone converted to Langstroth hives, and of course, those of you who bought bee equipment know the expense or sell bee equipment it's uh, this precision milled lumber comes at great cost, and, and, and the frames are, are really expensive in order to get into it. Um, and of course, you know, I have farmer friends who wanted to get into beekeeping. The newspapers say all the bees are going to die anyway. But <laughs> so um, the price of startup in beekeeping has been really inhibitive, and to this point where either you're born into it for a living or you like it because uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge. But it didn't have to be that way. We, I'm going to do a little review of some of these uh, hives that go back that actually are legal. So I had these 180 hives up in New York, and I really had no uh, uh, money to buy Langstroth hives. I would have had to go into debt for about $20,000 in order to build the commercial bee equipment in that style. So I really started thinking about what are, are my alternatives in beekeeping. So. This is one of the first inspectable hives that's on record uh, back to 1682. Uh, a UK explorer named uh, George Weller uh, documented this in Greece, like that, where they, they were just putting these sticks on top of a basket, like that. And we know back to the, even the time of Aristotle that they were doing hive inspections in Greece. Uh, so it was fascinating that uh, this traditional hive was used for a long time. Um, without having to uh, destroy the combs or, or kill the bees in order to harvest the honey. But uh, this evolved over centuries to uh, the Hubert Leaf Hive was in the late 1700s uh, of a French nobleman named Francois Huber who wrote several books and did a lot of experiments building a frame around the combs uh, a good you know, 50 plus years before Langstroth patented uh, his movable frame. But Hubert built all these himself in order to make all these bee observations and was a pioneer in, in uh, documenting like that queens made it outside of the hive and all these uh, novel observations. But by the mid-1800s, things were getting weird. <laughs> you know, Hives uh, uh, took on all this intricate stuff. Like This is one of the weirdest hives that I've ever found, the Nuts Collateral Hive, where people put these uh, crazy class glass jars and funny windows, but this wasn't really functional in any way. It just had weird uh, tiers and chimneys and stuff for the bees to go into. And it was just kind of more of a pursuit of the wealthy uh, to have. It's like, kind of like furniture that, that bees also lived in. 
But um, by the time Langstroth came around, everyone adopted that model. But there's a lot more to beekeeping other than our, what we know as commercial beehives these days. This is one of my favorite books that you can read about the history of hives by Dr. Eva Crane. This is kind of her life's work, published in the late 1900s. An awesome bee book is probably my, be my favorite of all time. World History of Beekeeping and Honey Hunting. So I had these 180 hives. They were running out of room. I was totally broke. And so I did some reading uh, uh, and talked to a couple people who pointed me towards the Peace Corps, where in countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, they were making a trough hive uh, that they called a Kenyan topper hive that they could build for pennies, it didn't have any precision frames or, or things like that. They could build them simply and quickly and help the beekeepers in Africa have a more, um, uh, uh, an easier way to harvest honey and inspect their hives. So I'm gonna uh, do a magic trick right now. I'm gonna make a Kenyan top bar hive appear out of thin air for y'all. So it's like a, kind of an abracadabra moment, but uh, here we go. It's basically thin air, but. These are baby blue ones. I have some baby pink ones as well. So there you go. There's a beehive for you. <laughs> so on this, this trough hive sits these top bars, like so. And the bees actually make their cones off of these bars. And I like to cut a shallow groove in here and glue in popsicle sticks. So about four popsicle sticks down the length of this bar. And the bees will use that wooden ridge to build their cones off of to hopefully be inspectable. So you can take this hive apart, put it back together, inspect it for diseases like American fowl brood, inspect it for varroa mites, harvest the honey easily. So I started making lots and lots of these top bar hives, filling them with bees. And uh, I remember one year I had to make 5,000 of these top bar hives. I had to eat 20,000 popsicles just to support my beekeeping habit. <laughs> I don't know popsicle sticks for that. But you know, the things that you do for your bee operation and stuff. But um, well, this is a buddy of mine. This is Kirk Webster. He's a bee breeder in Vermont. He uses Russian bees and makes them up a mountainside in isolation. Uh, and he doesn't treat his bees. He's literally probably the only person who told me that I could pull it off, that I could keep bees alive without treating for varroa mites. Like I said, all my friends even said that all my bees would be dead in two years, except for Kirk. And he's been at it oh, about 30 years now, breeding bees, uh, using these hardy Russian bees in Vermont, uh, up a mountainside. Uh, Kirk isn't a top bar beekeeper. This is more like a blackmail photo. <laughs> this is him working one of my hives. But um, it's really awesome to read about his program at kirkwebster.com. You can read about his breeding schematics and how he's been able to make it work. And so I give Kirk a shout in all my talks because he was one of my early supporters. And, uh, you know, about 17 years ago when I first started going this route. So I started making lots and lots of these top bars and I worked up to about 300 of them and I was selling these in top bar hives. I made a three or four foot long hive. I would sell some brood and some bees and a queen as a, a nuke, a nucleus hive, a starter hive for people. And I realized I was selling all my cones away when I did that. And when I harvested honey, I would just come and with a, to take a honeycomb and brush the bees off and I would just cut the comb off of the bar and then I would just mash it with a stick in, in a bucket. And so when I harvested honey, I was destroying the combs as well, just like the old skep methods, the straw basket methods. So I realized I was selling or, or mashing up all my combs and it was really hard for me to expand the business and grow because uh, more combs means more bees and they can just grow faster. So rather than selling uh, nukes, uh, selling the brood away, I started shaking packages. So a package, a little box like this uh, that you see, uh, you can shake three or four pounds of bees in there, and it's just like a swarm. And basically, I approached my bees as if uh, uh, I was just um, simulating their swarming behavior. In the spring, the hive gets crowded, and the old queen will leave with about half the bees, and they'll raise a new one uh, in the original home. So I just simulated this process. I saw my top bar hive was about to swarm. I'd go and I'd find the queen. I would put her in a little tiny cage, such as this one, scoot her in there. And then I would just shake some of, the, of her own bees, two or three or four pounds of her own bees, into a package box, and I could just sell that shook swarm rather than selling my comb. So I started doing lots of these shook swarms like that. And I just made a simple package funnel out of cardboard and duct tape to kind of 
met the uh, it matched the rest of the aesthetics of the operation. So, um, but I started thinking: Is like, am I a natural beekeeper? Is this natural beekeeping? Does natural beekeeping you know, like even exist? It sounds kind of like a paradox. But like, maybe if you have bees in an oak tree, that's natural beekeeping. But I'm certainly like uh, on that side of uh, the equation of like uh, uh, biological beekeeping or working way of the, the way the bees do it. So like towards natural beekeeping or whatever you want to call it. But I'm also still a commercial queen producer, and I was still grafting using these production methods, grafting into top bar hives like this. And so I started thinking, how big do I want to get? Where, where do I fit in in this bee world? So. Around that time, I visited uh, Kona Queens on the big island of Hawaii. At that time, they were the largest queen producers in the world, producing around 300,000 queens a year. And these were just some of their cell raisers that they were grafting into. And this was an incredible system that they had. Um, they had a double queen system, which means there was a queen on this side, in this double stack nuke, and there was a queen on this side here. And they had a queen excluder. Uh, that spanned both of the, the little nuke, uh, both sides, both nuke boxes. A single queen excluder. That queen excluder lets the worker bees pass through, but the queens are too big to get through that excluder, which is good because if the queen could get around there, they would kill each other because there only is one queen in the hive, usually. So that queen excluder kept those queens from getting to each other, and then a single box would sit on top of that queen excluder. And they had a pipe going down each one of these rows, that pipe hooked up to a giant mechanical bellows. That bellows blew smoke down the length of this pipe with little offshoots underneath each one of these little hives. That smoke would drive the young bees upwards through the queen excluder into those boxes above the excluder. And so when they had enough young bees and the hives were just bubbling out with bees above that excluder, they would slide in a piece of sheet metal and make that top box queenless. Let it sit queenless in that state for a couple hours and then they would put their graft in. About five days later, those cells would be capped and ready to move to an incubator for another five days and the process was just repeated again and again. And this is how they raised 300,000 queens in a year. I thought it, found it just totally fascinating. Uh, just so much innovation and creativity of how these beekeepers uh, uh, make their ends meet. But it's way bigger scale than I was ever going to be. <laughs> but uh, it's just a, a cool little um, niche experiments that they do. But I knew that no matter what kind of beekeeping I did, I was going to stick to treatment free. But I like this phrase, treatment free but not stupid. The way I look at our bee problems these days is environment, methodology, and genetics. So if you're having problems with your bees, they probably the problem falls in one of these categories, and you can uh, take a lens to look at it and, and a means to fix it. So I, I'll dissect these a little bit while we have a, a time. So uh, environment, you know, it, a lot of it depends on how many bees you have in the area. Uh, if bees are really stressed, if, they're, if they really have to compete for forage, it's uh, not going to go well because I find that environment is most important. I think you can just take about any kind of bees, any kind of genetics, and you can do just about anything to them. But if you're in a really good area, good area like uh, parts of California, parts of Texas, parts of Florida, or Hawaii, those bees like, tend to survive no matter what you do <laughs> to it. Like, uh, down in Florida, I actually think it's pretty hard to kill bees. We still find ways, but a lot of beekeepers migrate to the south or migrate to California just because it's easier because, well, there's more forage. There's more forage throughout the year. They don't have the cold temperatures. Uh, cold temperatures means that the bees don't have to cluster for as long. When they're clustered, the bees are in close proximity with each other so the diseases can spread faster. Also, warmer temperatures mean that the, uh, the pupation cycle, you know, bees are cold-blooded, so if it's a real hot week, they can pupate a little bit faster. And the mites are always breeding in the bee brood, so if the bees can emerge a little bit quicker, it means the mites don't have as much time to propagate themselves. But all like little tiny things that make the south uh, of warmer temperatures a little bit easier to keep bees alive. So, um, but methodology, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about methods that any beekeepers can do. 
in order to curtail your varroa mite reproduction, things like that. So um, I've, I've already mentioned brood breaks. You know, most of your mites are always in the brood. When uh, a mite emerges on an adult bee, the first thing that mite wants to do is find a larva and go crawl underneath the larva into the royal jelly and hide there. They actually have snorkels on the tops of their heads so they can hide underneath the larva and not be seen by the other bees. It's because the worker bees have a grooming behavior, they have a biting behavior, they'll actually clean each other off. Uh, the Russian bees actually do a dance. When, when, a bee, when a sister bee is in trouble, there's a shaking dance that attracts the other bees and they all come and groom her and bite the mites. Not only brush them off of her, but actually bite them and pull up their legs and things like that. You find them on the bottom board all damaged and they clean the mites off of each other. But most of the mites are always in the calf brood, hiding. So the bees can't ever get to them unless there's a brood break. And what a brood break means is that the queen, she's gonna leave the hive as if the hive swarms, you know? When a natural swarm occurs, the old queen leaves with about half the bees. Almost three weeks go by before that new queen gets mated. There's no brood, there's no bee brood left in that hive. So all the mites that are in that brood are now phoretic. They're now crawling around on the adult bees, exposed to their grooming behavior. And it's almost like the bees know what they're doing, right? It's like this cleansing time in the hive. It's this brood nest turnover. It's like hitting the reset button and the bees are able to clean themselves up. The problem is when your hive swarms, from a commercial perspective, that's like half of your money flying out into the woods. It can really hurt your honey crop. And uh, it's a really like swarming, you don't want them to go into your neighbor's house and, and you know, not get exterminated, things like that. So we don't, like, um, well, when I'm out in the woods and I have bees out in the countryside, when they swarm, I just know that they're keeping themselves clean. It's a size of, uh, sign of their vitality, but if you're in the suburbs or stuff, I try really try to keep the bees from swarming, and I do that by simulating swarms. I see that they're making swarm cells, ideally before they swarm, I'll move the queen. I'll actually remove her, I'll put her in a cage, and I sell queens to other beekeepers, let them raise their own queen, or I will replace her with a grafted queen cell that I'll move from a cell raiser over. So. You can either let them swarm maybe two times a year. Uh, it's just like uh, two times per season. That's kind of their natural rate that they'll do it. And swarming is just gonna keep your bees healthy. And you'll find that you won't have to treat or hopefully won't have to treat as much because the bees are doing the treating, they're doing the cleansing. Um, or you can simulate the swarming by constantly removing the queens or a couple times a season. I'll do it maybe five or six times when in my mating nukes my mating nucleus, my little baby hives that I'm selling queens from. So that is, uh, the brood breaks are really what keeps my operation clean. It's not magic genetics of like mite fighting bees or, or, or uh, hygienic bees like that. Those are all good, but they're not magic <laughs> like that. You can't just put a queen in there and expect your mites to disappear. Not 100% of the time. But uh, I do pursue like v uh, VSH, for real sensitive hygiene and things like that, but my operation survives by doing brood breaks. And so I'll split or uh, uh, do simulate swarms in all my hives, unless I get to the hive and it's already swarmed, and I just see that as they've done the job for me <laughs> already. So there are some other approaches uh, that you can take, ones like I mentioned, integrated pest management. You can count the mites in your hive. You can sample a half cup of bees, that's about 300 bees, and you can put them in soapy water. It kills the bees, but it also kills the mites. The mites will fall to the bottom, and you can count your infestation rates. I don't think it's all that accurate, but it'll give you a sense of how many mites per 300 bees you have, and give you more data if you do want to do a treatment, or if you do uh, think you need to do a brood break, or things like that. Me doing brood breaks is all preventative, and I do it to the whole operation. And like I said, if I don't do it, the bees do it themselves. It's in their biology to break their brood cycle. If you want repeatable results, treating might be the, the, the route that, that makes more sense. And we're all different kinds of beekeepers, you know, and we can all still be friends, you know. I say treatment-free but not stupid. I'm aware of what varroa mites can do to decimate hives. So, um, I find that, uh, you know, I intended to treat way back in 2005. I was going to get samples of my mite loads, 
treat, spot treat where I had to and requeen with a survivor stock that didn't need treatment, but I just never got around to it. I was too busy making more bees. Once I knew how to graft and how to rapidly reproduce bees, how to grow my own, I was so busy doing that and I just didn't fear the mite anymore. You know, we spend so much time talking about varroa mites in this industry. Every meeting I go to or every conference is all about mites, mites, mites. Makes me wonder if dog lovers go to dog conventions and spend the whole time talking about fleas. But <laughs> it's, it's pretty easy to get the fear or have someone tell you that uh, all your bees are gonna die if you don't. Well, knowing bee biology is gonna be your best ally. It's gonna help you the best. What would the bees do? Bees have all the tools they need to clean up varroa mites. Just by brood breaking, by swarming, things like that. So in my operation, I just follow their biology. But there's other ways to do it. Um, we were talking about Randy Oliver. He has this mite zero breeding program where he, he is doing just that. Uh, he's doing these mite samples, these uh, alcohol washes to get a sampling of uh, how many mites are in every one of his 1,500 hives. And he's just treating and requeening whenever those mites get above threshold. But he always finds some that keep the mites low naturally, probably by grooming or by varroa sensitive hygiene finding the mites and removing the infested pupa, the pupae from uh, 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 the hive. So some bees have these other mechanisms, and so he's trying to propagate that <laughs> stock and requeen the ones that do get infested. Uh, with, it takes a lot of work, uh, of course. And he's uh, been at it for several years, and it's, it's starting to really improve. And about 20% of his operation now can survive without mites, and he's walking the walk. It's really cool to see. And he's also able to make honey, sell a thousand nukes a year, and pollinate almonds. And a good percentage of his operation now can be treatment free uh, without losing everything or taking the risks or having to do brood breaks on all of his hives. So there's a lot of different ways to go about doing this with like means to an end, spot treating, IPM, or doing preventative brood breaks through their whole operation. And then um, there are some genetics that are getting really good at handling the mites. A queen that you could put in there and they will take the mite, uh, mite uh, count of the hive down once her offspring emerge. So some of those mechanisms, we'll talk about genetics. Now this is one of my varroa sensitive hygiene queens uh, that I had for several years. She just passed on this past year, but she was three years old, which is a long time. So, But she was an instrumentally inseminated queen, which is uh, means that uh, she was done, uh, uh, inseminated in a lab with special genetics like that. So when I raise a daughter, I, I'm almost uh, assured of what traits those daughter queens will have. And she was a varroa sensitive hygiene, which means that these bees have several traits. They have a very acute sense of smell. So they can smell when a bee pupa is infested by a mite. They will uncap that cell and they will remove that pupa along with the mite and are able to keep the mites down that way. It's just one mechanism among many. It has nothing to do with grooming, it has nothing to do with disease resistance, mm -hmm. or things like that. This is just one mechanism of smelling the mites and removing them from the pupae. Um, but it's highly inheritable that they found. This was developed at the USDA bee lab in Baton Rouge over the last 20 years. And it's VSH queens, you'll see them for sale here and there, and they're becoming more popular because they're, it's a highly inheritable trait. But, like I said, it's just one mechanism, and that mechanism is actually breeding bees to cannibalize their own young. So, do you think it'd be more controversial? Uh, about a decade ago, when these bees were first released, they were uh, cannibalizing too much. Maybe 90% of their own brood, whether they had a mite on them or not. But in the last several years, uh, the program has really improved. And some of these bees are very good stock. Like that, and it's a it's a trait of bee that this uh, uncapping behavior. It's not a breed of bee. It's not like an Italian bee or a Carniolan bee or a Russian bee like that. All bees have this this grooming uh, this a uh, brood removal trait. But you can take any stock of bee, any genetics, and augment this trait if you have an isolated breeding program like the USDA lab does. So that is a means of breeding for varroa resistance to have lower mites all the time but it's actually not the mites that are killing our bees, it's actually the diseases that these mites are vectoring. It's just like Lyme's disease. You know, it's vectored by ticks. You can try to control the ticks, uh, to control the disease, but it's really the disease that will do you in. So 
breathing for low mic counts all the time, it's not accounting for Varroa tolerance, hives that can host lots of mites and then not get sick. I've seen mites, the most I've ever seen in like a, an alcohol wash was 44 mites per wash. And so that's a lot of mites. So like normally that hive would die, but that, be, that hive survived the winter and the next year they swarmed and the mite counts went down and they went on to live. So they didn't have Varroa resistance or any grooming behavior or anything like that, but they had Varroa tolerance. They could tolerate the Varroa and they didn't get the diseases for some reason. One of the best ways that they, uh, to keep your bees healthy and not have them get these diseases have them be well fed, well nourished. It's just like humans. When we're well nourished, we tend to stay healthy. Like, like that. So same with bees, you know, they are what they eat. <laughs> well, my favorite bees to use are local bees. I think that they will always do the best. They will anticipate your honey flow, they'll build up before it so they can make you surplus honey. They will shut down before winter comes so they have the right size cluster, the right brood nest structure. I think local is, all, uh, is always the best. Um, they'll just know your area. But they might not have the mite resistance. They might not be magic bees. Just because you find a hive that's been living for years in a building or a tree, it doesn't mean you can put them in a Langstroth hive, make them grow 10 feet tall, expect them to still survive. It's just a different world when they get to swarm. So I like local bees, even if they're not DSH or mite biters or things like that, I'll take local bees and as long as they break the brood cycle a couple times, they tend to live. That's what they're used to doing. So, and all, of course the local bees are free. You can get them out of swarms, out of buildings, or you can get paid to actually remove them. So. The whole idea is to make more bees, right? Yeah, they gotta be treatment free, but not stupid. All of my like, like hardcore organic and treatment free friends, they all raise their own queens. And by various means, I mean, uh, I'll go into now like some of the intricate things about how I run my queen business and how I do about 5,000 queens a year. Um, but I'm gonna have to talk about like simpler stuff that any backyard beekeeper can do here shortly. But these, uh, it's all about like making more bees and growing your own. And you can make a lot of bees really quickly, like that. Um, I wish these were my queen cells. They're, they're not. These are Michael Palmer's queen cells. He's a bee, another beekeeper in Vermont and a good buddy of mine. He's just like raised the standards of excellence of what queens can be. And these queen cells look really good. So there's a virgin queen in each one of these that will emerge. And so after the graft, at 10 days later, <coughs> put each one of these queen cells into a little starter hive, a little baby hive, and they'll go on their mating flights from there. So you need lots and lots of little beehives to put each one of these queen cells in. So I was doing top bar hives and I started, I started making really tiny ones so I can make more and more queens all the time. So I did little tiny six inch flower pots, little terracotta pots, and I would put little baby top bars on them and they actually worked. The bees made some comb and the queens would go on mating flights, come back and start laying eggs, and they were just cute as can be. But I had trouble keeping up with them because they were so small. They were, were either swarming or starving all the time. And I started reading that it's better for a queen's health that she goes at least three weeks after cell placement. After placing one of my ripe grafted queen cells, it's better to not cage her too soon. And uh, the studies showed that uh, those longer uh, going queens, before they were caged, they had better ovarial development, they lived longer, they had better queen acceptance after they were caged and given to another beekeeper. So I wanted them to go at least three weeks after placing the queen cell. And these things were just way too small, so I, I ended up eating them all. But uh, I got the bees out of them first. <laughs> and I came up with a different design, actually. And uh, actually, I was walking down the aisle in the supermarket one day, and I came across this. This is the forefront of beekeeping technology. It is a barbecue skewer. It's just a simple bamboo skewer. And I was walk walking down the supermarket and I saw this and I said, I can put bees on that. And so I started making these little tiny box hives like that and just laying these skewers on top of that really simple. This isn't me, this is my evil twin who wears a tie <laughs> sometimes, but the bees will actually make their combs off of these skewers straight most of the time. And I realized I could build my whole hive now without using a table saw at all. It's, uh, I have a simple chop saw, but it, this is really simple to build just with hand tools like that. And it goes back to like the 1700s. As soon as you could get some milled lumber, beekeepers were hammering these boards together, making these old school hives. But now with these combs that were growing off of the barbecue skewers, 
you can have an inspectable hive like that, but just build it just for pennies. It's about 80 cents of lumber. I go to the sawmill, I, I give them jars of honey, they give me like twice what I paid for. So, you know, about 80 cents for about a buck, buck 50, you can build a hive. Uh, but really, I don't know, you show me a dumpster, I can build you a couple beehives out of the contents <laughs> these days. So I started making these, these hives that are even simpler to build than the, the top bars and started just making lots and lots of them at, at all times. So generally they sit on top of a milk crate. The bottom is just a 12 by 12 inch tile and then their top will be an 18 by 18 inch tile. Like that. Again, it's all just pennies to build this queen operation uh, from scratch. So we sit on these little red wagons and I even put dividers in, in here and made them even I kept them like a, a, a pretty small size because it just takes a few bees to send that queen out on a mating flight and then come back. And I started getting hyper organized to visit this hive every three weeks during our queen rearing season. So, um, and I do keep notes uh, on top of that. So every week, this was a minus Q, minus Q, minus Q. So when I had a divider in here, um, I had two little baby hives, then I would put another box on top with a divider and two baby hives on that. So every stand would have four little baby hives that I would visit every three weeks. So this tile on top of these four little mating nukes uh, never had a miss. It says minus Q, minus Q, minus Q. The queens always made it back from their mating flights. We, at the end of the season, we stole all the queens and left one QR, which means queen right. Like that, combined all the nukes to get them ready for winter. So after a couple of brood breaks of like you know, curtailing the varroa mite population, the brood started looking like this. It was like virtually mite free, just through these mechanical brood breaks that bees do anyway, if left to their, lo uh, to their lonesome. And I realized that this brood is what I wanted raising the next generation of a queens, of queen cells, like that. So I made a cell raiser box that could take these cones of brood from the mating nukes because they almost had no mites on them and they're super well nourished, like super brood. Those are the young bees I wanted to raise uh, the next round of queen cells. So I made these long trough hives and I started grafting into these every seven days. Every seven days I would put more brood in here and I would put a new graft. And after a couple rounds of doing that, they start to look like this. You know, more bees than will fit in the box. You know, this is what you want your cell raisers to look like if you're gonna put 40 or 50 of these, these queen cups in here. So uh, lots of young bees, they have these hypopharyngeal glands, which are what produces royal jelly. They feed that look, all the larvae I give them that I graft extra royal jelly and each one of those larvae can become a queen. And we do it every seven days, so every week we get to try again. Um, um, this is the way that I'm doing it. Those uh, hives are always queenless. We call them queenless starter finishers. They start and finish the queen cells, uh, queenless cell raisers, you know. Um, this is a great book, the, the Laid Law book. It's famous among <laughs> queen breeders as the go-to book. It'll tell you all the intricate ways of setting up a cell raiser. I'll just uh, uh, explain my process and the way that I do things, but reading this book it will uh, give you a lot of options on how to do it because I've been raising queens now, oh, ever since the beginning, 19 years. I, I've really never done it the same way twice, because there's lots of ways to do it. But I've got a pretty organized method these days. So Monday, like I said, we're boosting those cell raisers with, with brood from last week, and we are grafting into them. On Tuesday, we catch queens from that week's mating yard, and we bank brood. Banking brood means that we're taking out that brood and we're putting it above a queen excluder, again, so a queen, a queen can't get to it and lay on it, for next week's cell raisers. We want that brood to be totally capped, mm -hmm. like, like this one. We don't want any eggs or larva going into the cell raiser, because if there is a rogue egg or larva, they can make a queen cell off, uh, out of that. And if a queen cell, <laughs> if I don't see it and it emerges, it'll kill all the grafted queen cells that I put in there. It's, it's high drama. Is the first thing that a queen does when she emerges is look for sisters and actually you know, use her stinger to kill her sisters. High drama inside a beehive. So I want that brood to be totally capped. No eggs or larvae. They aren't able to raise any uh, rogue queens. But on Wednesday, we finish catching that, that week's uh, mating yard. Thursday, we place ripe queen cells. Those cells are 10 days old. They weren't grafted on this Monday. They were grafted on the previous week's Monday. So they're 10 days old. 
um, by the time I place that, 10 days after the graft from the previous week. And so we do this week after week, and I know, because of this level of organization, I know what I am doing every single day of the year. And believe it or not, I actually need this structure in my life, that the only, being hyper-organized is the only way that I can actually keep this business operating. And we're out there rain or shine catching queens some weeks to make room for the queen cells. And generally, I'll do 300, you know, between 200 to 300 little baby hives every week. I have three mating yards. So I'll do one mating yard one week, then the next one the next week, and the third one. So three weeks go by by the time I am back after I place that queen cell. So we'll catch the queens out of here. These nukes sit queenless one to two days. We place the right queen cell in there, and I'm back into them in three weeks. At which point, if the queen made it back from her mating flight, they, they ought to be capping her her first brood so I know she's well mated and she's successful. They don't all make it back. We hope for 80%. When the honey flows on, we get over 90% of the queens making it back. But uh, it's high drama. When a queen leaves the mating nuke to go on a mating flight, she can get eaten by a purple martin, eaten by a dragonfly. She can get hit by a plane, struck by lightning. Who knows? <laughs> you know, they don't all make it back. That, that's what I know. But in theory, say they do make it back. Say I'm working 300 little tiny hives. If it's 100% mating, I get 300 queens that week. And I will go to the post office with a big stack of buzzing envelopes. You know, live bees, no heat, no sun, no pesticides. Um, a big stack of buzzing envelopes. And the postal employees think it's weird. I think it's weird. But I bring them a jar of honey, and the queens tend to get there on time in the mail. And people contact me wanting either gross sensitive hygiene or mite biters or Russian bees or any of this survivor stock. It's because I'm tracking all these genetics weekly like that. So that happens like every week uh, going and shipping the queens out. But say I get 300 queens at 100% out of 300 mating nooks. For these little hives to go another three weeks, I have to cut them back. I have to take brood out of them to give them more room. I'll just give them another empty barbecue skewer, and they're good to go for another three weeks. So I am actually more interested in harvesting the brood out of these mating nooks than I am the queen, because the brood is what drives the whole operation. The brood, uh, the first thing we do with the brood is, is shuffle a comb of brood to any hive that didn't have the queen come back, if it was a miss, if she, the queen's just missing, we'll give them some brood from one of the good ones to keep them going for another round. Then I'll take some brood and I'll bank it for next week's cell raisers. And then I still have extra brood every week. This mating yard is like a brood factory. So that extra brood then goes to out yards and I keep a percentage of the queens. And I use that brood to stock any losses that I had the previous winter or just do experiments on or just that I really only have out yards to test genetic stock. See about their mite tolerance, see their honey production, see their ability to survive winter, their gentleness, all these traits that we want to augment in our bees. So all that capped fruit just goes out to the outdoors and I'm just making more bees all the time in this hyper-organized system. And every week I get to try again. It, makes, it actually opens up a lot of variables for experimentation. I get to see how good the graft is every seven days. I get to try for a better graft. This was a perfect one. This was 40 for 40 all these queen cups will now become queen cells 10 days after the draft. Uh, I get to see how many queens I can catch, you know, sometimes 200 to 300 queens a week uh, come to fruition at the end of the cycle. That's super cool. We put them in those little cages and ship them UPS like across the country sometimes. Um, I get to see how good the queens are, their good quality, how large, how many ovarials, uh, uh, they'll have, this would have been a good queen. She's at purple eye stage right now if I hadn't opened up the queen cell <laughs> as a pupa. She would uh, probably have emerged in another day or two like that, but uh, not anymore because <laughs> I just wanted a good picture. But this is actually the first um, round of quality control. If the queen cell doesn't look good, it will never get placed in a mating nuke. So every week I, I cull some of the queen cells and they never get placed because they're the the, the runts of the litter, the smallest ones, and I have often made them into chocolate chip cookies with a queen pupa. Uh, I've never found anyone to eat these with me, <laughs> you know? but if you're going to come visit, we're going to eat queen pupa cookies. Like so, but I don't know, I'm a pretty alternative kind of beekeeper.
So um, this is an aerial view of one of my mating yards down south. There's probably about 400 nukes. So you're looking at the top, and each one of these tiles is a, a, a above four little baby hives like that. And I actually arranged it so each one of these little clusters is dedicated to a different family line. Like I said, it's a, it's a rabbit hole, you know, of how organized or how much like, thought and care you can, you can put into this. Of tracking genetics is, uh, becomes a whole other level. But uh, making more bees at all times. Well, since I knew what I was doing every day of the year, I started opening up the apiary to visitors who can come and kind of learn my system because after years of raising queens, I got this weekly schedule now. It seemed to take a lot of stress out of it and wanted to teach it to people. Uh, this is my buddy Aaron from Jennings Apiaries. He about, had about a hundred of his own hives, raised some queens here and there, really wanted to raise his own local stock and be a queen producer back in Louisiana. So he came to visit me, did the four day system, like learned the processes and stuff and loved it, had a great time. This is him grafting some, some queen cups. And at the end of four days, he looked at me and said, this is way too much work. I'm just gonna buy queens from you. I'm like, oh geez, I'm really, really trying to uh, uh, have more people, out, uh, train more people so they can go and produce local stock in their areas. And I realized that he was right, that it is too much work. <laughs> Not everyone like, uh, wants to be so bee crazy. Some people like to sleep and stuff. So I started uh, really investigating ways of making this simpler. How we can still grow bees, still be breeders and work on genetics and survivor stock like that, and still get genetics out there, but maybe not have a thousand little mating nukes or things like that, or be on this weekly uh, system. So how do we make this simpler? Well, these are just queen cells, like I showed you before in these queen cups, you know, and these uh, can get shipped in the mail. Um, you just put some cover bees on them to keep them warm in transit. They usually arrive the day they start to emerge like that, and so the beekeeper who receives this would like, have all their queenless splits ready to go and uh, put a queen cell in each one of those queenless splits and just shift the genetics slightly. And rather than buying a, a mated queen for $40, you can get a queen cell for $5 and uh, just have bees do more of the process and make the queens in your own backyard. So I see more and more beekeepers doing this rather than buying and selling mated queens in cages. Uh, this is a real cool transition step for beekeepers raising their own. But how do we make it even simpler than that? You know, um, you can just ship uh, two-day-old queen cells. So if you're good at that grafting process of picking up that larva, putting her in a little tiny queen cup, you can put those queen cups into a cell raiser, and this is what they look like about 48 hours later, like that. So this has a larva floating in the royal jelly in there, and this is actually the hardiest phase, the hardiest phase of a queen's life cycle. Uh, you actually want to cool them down and to slow down that larva's metabolism, and so they eat less, like so, and you just have to keep them damp. So we wrap, wrap them in, in, in damp cardboard, and you can ship them, and you don't even have to write live bees on the envelope, because there aren't any live bees, it's just larva in there. So we were, uh, have always been real interested in genetic exchange, exchanging survivor stock, and things like that. So uh, we wanted to pitch a grant to have like a, a, a in the Northeast uh, a Queen Breeders Cooperative. And I'm like, well, what do we need for a Queen Breeders Cooperative if we're going to pitch a grant to get some support to launch something like that? And like, uh, well, my first thought was that we need a giant party. We need a real good party, like a, a roundtable discussion, a meeting of the minds, and sharing of methods like that. Well, no grant is really going to just fund a big party, but. The second thing we would need for a queen breeders cooperative is a genetic exchange. So this is one way to, to make the genetic exchange simpler. So we pitched this grant to a, the SARE program, Sustainable Ag, Agriculture, Research, and Education, and we got a grant to look at these 48-hour queen cells just to see if they were good quality. So we looked at the, the mating, who was pretty much the same across the board. We compared the 10-day grafted queen cells, the conventional method used by queen producers, to the two-day, the 48-hour queen cells, and we also did walk-away splits. Walk-away meaning you steal the queen, or you just make the split, and you walk away. So the bees will make the queen. The bee, this, this is a no grafting involved. It's like bees' choice. It's an emergency queen, they call it. The bees go into emergency mode and build a new queen. So we did a, a trial just for comparison when the bees had the choice with no grafting. So we compared these three methods, and they were pretty much 
the same across the board in terms of mating percentage and queen quality. And I'll explain how we got the quality um, uh, data in, in a second here. But uh, we saw that some of the, the quality of the walkaway, these emergency queens, the, the, the queens that the bees raise themselves without the grafting, was really, really good. So um, this uh, data like, showed that the two-day cell method is viable and that the, uh, they can be really high-quality queens in the future of shipping these queen cells. Um, but the bees do a pretty darn good job just left to their own devices. So this was a little tiny walk-away split that, that we did where the bees had to raise their own queen and they've started about five or six of them. One, two, three, four, five. So these are all gonna be queen cells and eventually the best one is gonna win. You can go back in here and cut out extra queen cells. This is a mel uh, method developed by C.C. Miller uh, more than a century ago where he would actually take a comb of larvae and cut zigzags in it and the bees would make their queen cells on the edges of these cuts. And the idea is to prevent the queen cells from clumping together so you can use as many of them as possible. When they build them next to each other, you can't cut them apart uh, without damaging one of them. But when they're on the edges, you can cut them all out individually. And I've done this method a lot. I'll, I'll go in, I'll steal the queen, I'll come back in 10 days and use all the queen cells. And I find only maybe about half of them queen cells like, result in good queens. Some of the queen cells aren't very good and the bees probably would have chewed them down or they never would have come to fruition. So doing this method, I won't use all the queen cells, but I'll get a, an extra couple out of there, maybe at most like four or five of like uh, going back in after I, I de-queen the hive to get extra queen cells. But generally when I make a split, I just let the best one win like that. So uh, the bees will make several like that, but the first one out, the, that queen will go and actually sting her sisters and become the queen of that hive. So we start making lots and lots of these splits to try to see what conditions make the best queen when the bees raise their own, like, like in those. So uh, what we found, uh, we did a bunch of different volumes of hive. We did a bunch of different uh, densities of population in those different vol volumes. Uh, different uh, age of comb, new comb versus old comb, different uh, age of the brood, mostly capped brood, which is pupa, uh, versus open brood, which is larva. And uh, really the, the most significant factor we found was the age of the comb. We found that newer comb had much better mating success like that. So if you're gonna do uh, these walkaway splits or let the bees raise their own, having newer comb on there seemed to make a difference. But we also saw, like in this picture, the bees make their cells on the edge. I think that's because they have lots of room there to make a big peanut-shaped queen cell like that, and um, they can just widen the cell base to make a good queen cell like so. So that way the larva can just spin around there and feed, 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 and become a queen really quickly. They eat a massive amount in order to become a queen. So newer comb was one of the significant factors. So in doing these, these splits that we made, we did a bunch of different sizes, but I started making my hives a little bit bigger than just my standard six inch deep mating nuke. I now do a, a 12 inch deep, like so, with a bigger comb like that. I put the skewers, uh, uh, I tape them together now to make them extra strong to support those longer cones. You get a little bit more side attachments in there. Generally with the babies, we're just using like uh, butter knives <laughs> and stuff to, um, work our mating nukes, but these days, um, with these longer cones, I will use a wizard staff, we call it. We started calling these wizard wands or wizard staffs. A long bread knife, uh, I actually like, grind down the blades so they're safer for bee yard safety. And so these, if there's any side attachments on the longer cones, I can get down there and cut them to remove the comb. And they're still faster than working Langstroth hives, <laughs> getting in there, finding queens, putting them back together. And on these wizard wands, we've got a flamethrower, a little blow torch, a little hand torch on there, and we have a marking pen that we keep our notes. So everything you need is right there, clips onto your magnet belt, and it's like a, it's like a pirate's life with bees, you know, <laughs> having a sword out in the bee yard. So that's, that's pretty fun, and doing these box hives. So I run them a little bit bigger these days. I still have some babies, it's a Comfort Hive 1.0, the six inch deep ones, but the two boxes we call it a 2.0. And I put them on six-way pallets these days where I put 200 or 300 hives in a yard. Plastic pallets because they don't rot away, and so everything's elevated a little bit more like so. So this yard actually like, like experienced hurricane flooding, but the bees came through high and dry down in Florida, thankfully. 
So we took a bunch of these emergency walkaway queens. We sent them to the North Carolina State University B Lab. This is my friend David Tarpey's lab, and we call it the, the Queen Clinic, or some of us call it the Queen Machine, because you can submit a queen to this lab, and they'll weigh every part, uh, body part of the queen. They'll look at, uh, they'll measure the legs and the head width and the thorax, and then they'll actually dissect the spermatheca and tell you how many sperm are in the spermatheca, and stain those sperm to tell you how many of those sperm are actually viable and alive. And then they'll give the queen a grade. She'll get an A or C minus or something like that. The problem is you don't get the queen back. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, this is some of our most objective science, uh, the most objective data to say that, like, oh, well, these queens that the bees raise themselves are actually as good as what the beekeeper grafts. The stigma against letting the bees choose and raise their own queens uh, is that the beekeeper, when you graft that little tiny tool, you can get the youngest larva possible to make the best quality queen. Uh, she could be destined to be a worker bee or be a queen bee, but the younger you get the larva, the more queen-like she'll become and better potential quality queen. You can, a queen bee can live for years, actually, whereas a worker bee will only live for about five weeks <laughs> or so. So if she's more queen-like, started from a younger larva, uh, grafted by the hand of beekeeper is always thought to be the best way better than letting the bees choose the age of the larva. But it turns out, when you compare um, these emergency queens that we got to the, the national database, the thousands of queens submitted to the queen clinic here, that they are pretty on the high end of the spectrum of quality here. So it turns out the bees do know what they're doing. Bees know best. So this is some, uh, some real science to prove that. So grafting, to me, it's really not about getting a better quality. Grafting is all about the numbers. Like I said, grafting 40 or 50 into one box rather than letting the bees raise their own and only getting one like that. But if you can make your method simple enough, you can get about as many queens doing these walk-away methods than you can as grafting. If you make your boxes cheap enough and you have enough critical mass of bees to do it with. But, um, well, here she is. Today is her birthday. And she's caught in the act right now of slaughtering her sisters. High drama. Uh, I think she emerged from this cell right here, and she already tore down that one, that one. She's probably going for that one, and there can only be one queen or so. It's the first thing a queen does. Um, so it happens all the time, every year in most hives. <laughs> so, well, the results from that uh, second SARE grant that we got uh, for, to look at these uh, walkaway splits or these emergency queens. Uh, the goal is to come up with a recipe that we can recommend best management practices or, or, or whatever, recommendations. So we wanted to do something, come up with a good recipe that any beekeeper can do in their backyard. So we started calling it the runaway split. Uh, as opposed to a walkaway split, in my mind, a conventional walkaway split is yeah, I have a, a strong two-box hive. You take one of the boxes, rip it off, and put it on a new bottom board in a new location in the bee yard and just walk away like that, whatever side is queenless will raise its own queen. The runaway split, like this, gives you a little bit more control over the recipe. So what you do in this method is you pick up the entire hive, move the entire hive with the bees to a new location in the, in the same yard. You know, you can move them five feet or 10 feet, or you can move them on the same pallet or stand, just uh, change their entrance orientation, to have them face the back rather than the front like they were. So you move the, the hive, and in its place you put some empty boxes, and you move back some of the resources that they need to fill the queen. You pick up the hive, you move it, you move back some open larva, and you move back some food, some nectar and pollen. With the bees on that comb, ideally you don't move the queen back. Ideally, like the swarm, you know, the old queen moves to the new location. So this is a split that anyone can do, even in your first year as a beekeeper. So you don't need to be able to find your queen. You might even be scared of your bees. You don't need another bee yard. You don't have to shake any bees around. Just pick up your hive, move it, move back some cones of resources so they can raise their own. And check them back in a month. It either works or it didn't. You know, within a month, they should be just like uh, starting to cap the larva of the new queen if it was successful. If it wasn't, you can just recombine them and there's really no loss. Uh, it's something that's uh, easy for anyone to do. You don't need another bee yard or really know what you're doing, even. So, ideally, they make several queen cells and the best one will win. You just kind of like leave them alone and check them back in a month. If you want some extras, you can go in there 10 days later, 
cut out some extras and use them for other hives and speed up the process a little bit. So and ideally, you get a really good queen to lead your hive that way. So I do a lot of these walk away splits still. I, I, I really think it's great to give the bees the choice. And I, I know from this data that they're actually really good quality and it creates a, a good genetic di a diversity in the bee yard. Um, but I still do some grafting and stuff and I still am on that seven day uh, schedule during queen, uh, queen season as I myself queens as, as my livelihood. But um, you know, uh, like I showed you, I think in my queen rearing process, it can be very, very complicated uh, or it can be very, very simple like that. But I mean, these are just some regular swarm cells. You're going through your hive, you see some swarm cells, just put them in a nuke box right there, shake some extra bees in there. You're a queen rearer. And it doesn't have to be that hard. You're raising queens in your backyard because you're just like the bees are doing it for us. So it, it really doesn't have to be complicated. And I think everyone could be doing this. You know, in the peak of my season, I run about 2,000 of these little boxes like that. I, I tell people I have 2,000 hives, but they're all only this big. You know, I'm a different kind of beekeeper. But I really think my long term goal is to work down to five hives. You know, five hives, a fishing pole, and a hammock, <laughs> and a network of us sustainable beekeepers with five, ten hives in our backyard who, in a good year, we've got an extra swarm to give to your neighbor or bring to your bee club or give them a split and stuff, create this be it forward mentality that's helping each other with local stock. But in a bad year, you lose half or more of your bees, you know how to split your survivors. Rather than buying bees from, from Georgia or down south or queens from Hawaii, things like that, bees that aren't adapted to this area or, or the, the kind of operation you want to run, you know? Rather than buying in those stock, that stock to replace your losses, split the few survivors that you have left. And you'll find instantly that their survival will go up. If you start growing your own, that's your, you know, the, the path to having resistant, vigorous bees. Because, I mean, the, the guys who do migratory pollination and stuff, they work really hard, and it's, a, it's an awesome niche, and the work they're doing, they're the hardest work and most innovative people I know. But uh, it's a lot different than having a couple hives in your backyard here in Michigan that you want to keep alive with minimal inputs. It's just a different world like that. So the only way for us to uh, kind of promote backyard beekeeping with no treatments like that is to grow your own and make it work in your system. Get a bunch of bees, put them in the kind of boxes you want, do the kind of management that you want to do, plan on losing some of them, but then split your survivors and propagate the genetics that did work. And that next generation, you'll find that you have a lot more success instantly. And if once you know how to raise your own, you'll, you'll find that it's, it's easy to keep yourself in bees. It can be through grafting, it can be through walkaway splits. There's like some various methods to do that. But I see us uh, all becoming these micro honeybee breeders, you know. You put micro breeder, you put micro in front of anything, it becomes uh, more approachable and more benign, you know. Anyone can do this, <laughs> I feel. So, um, where am I at in time? Uh, yeah. A little bit left, <laughs> just just a little bit. I'm gonna run through some of this stuff really quickly. Um, I do uh, make honey, regretfully, you know. <laughs> I, I really uh, consider myself like an educator, an experimenter, and uh, and a, a, a queen breeder and, and propagator and sell bees. But we do make some honey from time to time, regretfully. It's sticky. It's messy. It's a it's like punishment for doing a good job. <laughs> you know, but I'm also like really into wax and, and doing different things with wax. Uh, we do comb honey uh, from our box hives and things like that. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the tricks and things that I do to keep the operation going. I work out of a Toyota Sienna all-wheel drive minivan. It's like my favorite tool. <laughs> it keeps the operation going. I do mobile feeding. I do feed. I don't use, do like any chemical inputs. I try to buy as little stuff as possible, but I find that the babies really do need some sugar to help them along, especially in their first year, in order to get ready for winter. So I'll just mix the feed with like a cement mixer and the drill in a 50 gallon drum. Like that, I'll either put quartz on top of here or a, a one gallon feeder. I like the shiny bubble wrap as the, as the inner cover. I can cut a hole in here, and just put the feeder right on top of this hive like that. So the babies especially need a, a, a little of a sugar syrup just to keep them going. Uh, but in the minivan, I can pack, I think, 82 of these little tiny boxes. And if I'm running a divider in that, that's 164 little mating nukes in the minivan. 
no one suspects the minivan. Right? It, could be, uh, it could be full of bees, or it could be living out of it, or both at the same time, you know? Um, but I also haul packages in that. Um, I'll block out the windows with shiny bubble wrap. I'll pin a bee net behind the front seats, and I'll just blast the air conditioning. They love the AC. And when I'm moving bees long distances, it's just like a long, dark night for them. Keep them cool. I really don't move bees anymore. I did for several years from Florida to New York with a little uh, Tacoma and 10-foot trailer. But I started having too many bees and moving them was just so much work that now I have a northern gene pool and a southern gene pool, and I just zip around trying to keep up with everything. <laughs> so it makes it a lot easier. Uh, but I do uh, sell package bees as well, and I can fit 100 packages in the minivan. Like so, I'm going to, to support the queens. And uh, sometimes this is what the floor of the minivan looks like. This is actually, I can see the floor in some spots, so this was a pretty good day. And uh, don't give me nice things. Just <laughs> it's like they're, they're discovering new species in this minivan. It's amazing. So uh, my package bees, I, I don't have a canning machine like the big package producers do, but I'll make a little bit of bee candy, just powdered sugar, with a little bit of honey mixed really well and just make a little feeder that goes into that package box to give them some food on the road. Uh, I do make some honey, I make some hybrid hives. Uh, I cut a lot of my 10 frame deeps. So people keep giving me Langstroth equipment <laughs> as donations and I'll chop them into six framers. And it's just therapeutic for me to chop up Langstroth equipment. I don't know why. <laughs> so, so these are like hybrids. So like I have my box hive, brood nest, and then the honey on top and I will spin that in the centrifuge. I do lots of experiments with comb honey. This is a fun one on tops of the box hives. It's my seven foot solar wax melter like that. This thing's great. It just doesn't really keep up <laughs> with all the wax I like to produce from mashing and straining. Um, it takes me nine cinder blocks to make a rocket stove like that. Well, I, I consider it a Langstroth frame storage facility. <laughs> so uh, I, it actually takes me uh, about a, uh, one top bar, one end bar of a Langstroth frame to make a really nice pot of coffee. Um, cinder block stove, but I use this to process a lot of my wax. I'll, I'll put a couple inches of water, put all the combs in there, stir it, bring it to a boil, and then just pour it through a strainer bag, like so, and then I'll press that down a little bit with like a wooden uh, press that I've made to make some nice wax, beeswax discs. Uh, make a lot of wax, make a lot of candles. These uh, morel mushroom candles, I can't make these fast enough. The stores just love them. So, uh, and then, Make a couple of beeswax experiments. This is um, these are luminaries. Uh, these are actually uh, water balloons, and so you fill it with water, put a clip on the top, you dip this about six, seven times in the beeswax, then you let the water out, and you can reuse the balloon. And you just drop a little tea light or votive into these beeswax bowls. And these are beautiful. They're like glowing orbs. They're really neat. So those are game changers. Uh, more inventions, gadgets, gizmos. This is my bee vacuum. Been beekeeping for any length of time. Someone's gonna ask you eventually to get bees out of a wall. You can get some really cool bees that way. This is my favorite bee vacuum I've ever made. It's a dust buster with the front taken off with a PVC elbow. So I cut a hole in the bottom of the bucket here. I put a five gallon strainer bag, paint strainer bag in here. It's the same bag I use to strain honey and strain beeswax. And so the intake comes up through the lid of the bucket here. The bees come in and have a real soft landing. In there, so it's cordless, it's really lightweight, easy to carry up a ladder, and I uh, use it more often than not in bee removals. But one of the most important things that you all can do is put up bait hives. Uh, follow Tom Seeley at Cornell. I don't have time to go into all the details, but Dr. Seeley uh, has done this research back in the 70s of what swarms are looking for. About a 10 gallon size cavity. Uh, if you've got a used bee box, that's great. But anything you, you can do to make it smell like a beehive, you can get free bees this way. Rub some wax in there, put an old comb, a handful of dead bees, whatever you got. A couple of drops of lemongrass oil. Lemongrass has citral in it. It's part of their Nasanov gland, their orientation pheromone. Put it uh, high up. I put them in deer stands out of barn windows. The higher up, the better, it seems. Just take them down before hunting season, you know. Uh, entrance, about two inch diameter or so. And I put them up in the shade. The swarms tend not to go into the sun. I think they, they don't want their comb to collapse. But if you do this, I mean, you can save bees from going into someone's building and getting sprayed. So even if you don't want to be a beekeeper, this is a great thing to do and just call a beekeeper. They'd be happy to come get it. And you could get some bees like this. This is a removal I did in upstate New York. 
uh, had been there every year for 20 years, and now they were knocking down this old farmhouse, and I just started cutting, and it ended up being 11 feet tall. There's about 200 pounds of honey in this wall. I found the queen early on. I marked her. I brought her into the breeding program, started raising daughters, and these were, this just became an awesome line of honeybees that I had. Again, they didn't have the mite resistance to be bulletproof, uh, but I found that just taking these bees and breaking the brood cycle, letting them raise their own once or twice a season, they, they survived and they're still going strong in my genetic pool. So putting up bait hives or doing removals, you can get these awesome local bees. So why? Why are we doing all this? I'm going to wrap it up here because we're just about out of time. But uh, these young people, you know, they really need something to do that's like not on their screens, not tapping their thumbs all the time. And those of you who are beekeepers here probably remember the first time you ever opened a beehive. It's a moment that I'll never forget. And this is a gift that we can give to anyone else, especially these young folks who are looking for something to do. And to me, it doesn't really matter if like all our bees live or if we're the best beekeepers in the world. What matters to me is that we're doing stuff outside, that we're trying new things, that we're working with living creatures. You know, and trying to be part of this world and figure it out uh, rather than trying to just like, uh, you know, turn on the water, turn on the lights and, and have everything just like be served to us, you know. It's just a richer experience for me. And this is something we as beekeepers can pass on, just being part of this whole ecology. So that's that same beekeeper later in the season with her bees in her top bar hive, getting that connection. And she gets stung. She doesn't care. She you knows it's part of the process, you know. It's pretty awesome to see uh, people take it up. And so for me, and, and uh, being a beekeeper, I'm trying to keep it fun, you know, to re retain my sense of awe, my sense of wonder every time I go out to my bee yards and open up my hives. Because if we don't keep it fun, then beekeeping is going to go by the wayside, you know? Bees aren't like livestock. You know, they're, they're kind of more wild. They're like semi-wild creatures. They still have this resilience and this wonder about them. So if we don't keep beekeeping fun, enjoyable and exciting and uh, keep it from being just like moving boxes all the time. We're all just going to end up as the lone beekeeper out in the crowd. Well, so I started with this image of, of the mice, you know, and like making PVC structures and it's just an alternative perspective. You know, how do we like work with these mice and like share in their bounty rather than try to control them? And I love starting the, the, the bee talk like that. And I, I've always thought, like, well, what does this really have to do with beekeeping at all? Just like a weird niche thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, there is one tie into beekeeping. These are collections from, my, my, these are some samples from my propolized mouse collection. You know, <laughs> when a mouse makes a wrong turn, it goes in and gets mummified by the bees. They keep them sterile. So, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a little alternative. I think these things are beautiful. <laughs> but pretty neat. Well, well, that's one of my favorite queen bees, and that's my last slide. So I, I maybe got time for a, a question or two, but I'm Anarchy Apiaries. I brought you all some party favors of this year's beekeeping survival guide. My little zine, make sure you grab one. Feel free to copy it, spread the love and stuff. If you all got any questions or things like that, just uh, give me a shout. At, uh, at just look up anarchyapiaries.org. You can find me that way. I do eventually respond. So, <laughs> Thanks, where are we at, James? Next year. <laughs> How about I sing a song about Varroa mites? <laughs> Your friend, it's like, I spend the whole time talking about mites and a treatment-free bee talk, but I mean, it's a reality's reality, but like I said, don't get the fear, you know? Bees are gonna be just fine. <laughs> All right, like, last thing here, I'm gonna sing a song about Varroa mites. Varroa is a little red mite that comes from Asia, so they say. It's come all the way around the world, and now it's living in the USA. It's looking for a home, living on the cold, cold, cold. Looking for a home, living on the cold. Well, the first time I saw the Varroa, it was sucking on a bee. After a round of brood, I saw it again, and it made a whole family living on the cold, looking for a home. Well, the beekeeper took a pesticide strip and put it in the hive. Now all the honey and wax are ruined, and the mite still ain't died. It's living on the cold, looking for a home. I tried oils and powders and poisons. 
still the mites are strong. The bees got weak and sick, and now almost all are gone. We ruin their home, can't leave them alone. Well, the burrow I told the beekeeper, they better get some more bees. A couple of three pound packages, make a tasty menu for me. I'll make them my home, make them disease prone. Make much cold, and they didn't make much honey. All year long, I'm pulling out my hair and spending all of my money. Yes, I'm hooked on bees. Someone help me, please. If anyone should ask you who was it wrote this song, tell me, old beekeeper, and all the bees are gone. They left their home looking for cleaner comb. About nothing no more. I know I can't fight the mites. I'll get out of the way, and then one day the bees will be alright. Happy in their home, living on the go, go, go. Happy in their home, just leave them alone. Thank you, everyone. That's a true story. Good luck this year.